Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George. I'm here with my co-host Omi, Nomi, and as our special guest, we have John. And today, Nomi's going to like lead us through a discussion of how there are various interdisciplinary ways of understanding how our wills are causal rather than free. Okay, Nomi, let's. Uh, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, so my current understanding is that there are uh, three different types of information interacting with each other uh, in the creation of what we call will. Uh, there is the genetically transmitted information, there is uh, culturally induced information, and also the personally acquired information. So these three can uh, complement or they can be at odds with each other. Uh, we will explore this in more detail, but my idea is that when we are looking at genetically transmitted information, we are um, uh, looking at physics and chemistry and biology, uh, but when we come to culturally induced, uh, we are in the social realm, so we have to bring in anthropology, sociology, uh, psychology, and when we are personally acquiring information, uh, those processes of learning, they are of course related to psychology, uh, but they might uh, be dealing with information which culture does not support. So. Those three types of information interact in very complex ways to create processes of thought. And then once we are living in a culture, situation becomes relevant. Uh, we interact in a situational modality and we make choices. So by integrating different levels, different disciplines, we develop a better understanding of uh, choices that human beings make and also then bringing in levels of development. Uh, last time you mentioned that uh, we have this cognitive science model where human beings uh, move from sensory motor to concrete operational to formal operational uh, thinking. And then uh, we have Eastern ways of uh, understanding consciousness where they bring in more complex uh, levels of consciousness which might include uh, the higher mind, the illumined mind, the Ill illumined um, intuitive mind, uh, overmind, supermind, uh, which is coming from Aurobindo's uh, thinking, which Ken Wilber uh, subscribed to a lot. So by bringing in Eastern philosophy and Western psychology, uh, we understand choices better. Uh, and once we understand the causal dimensions, we can perhaps uh, learn to make better choices. So it, has, it can inform the processes of education. It can inform the processes of uh, adult development once we know uh, what we are capable of and what we are, uh, the way we are currently behaving. Is there anything else about education? Education is a transmission of information, isn't it? Uh, when we are in a particular culture, we uh, have certain selected texts that we read and talk about and discuss uh, in different formats. Uh, so, yeah, but at the same time, we can also learn what is uh, not part of the curriculum. Uh, so in, in, in a sense, th these, but we are going to process the, those different ty types of information uh, with the help of our biological brain. So there's going to be a very complex interaction, but the specificity of information is going uh, to play a very complex role in the choices we make. <coughs> Would you like to say something, George? Yes, w within the area of education, I think that's um, where it is very important. Um, in other words, um, we invest in our future, in the future of our children, the future of our planet through education. Now, um, if someone believes that human beings have free will, that education is meaningless, it's valueless, because a person who believes we have free will will say, will assert, well, it doesn't matter what we teach our kids, what we teach ourselves and each other. It doesn't matter whether we have education or not, because at the moment of every choice, we will be free to either um, go along with that information or not. And see, like, when, when, when we have that perspective that, um, that we have a free will that allows us to just make choices, then, um, education, education as a valuable tool it is both in our personal lives and in, in crafting the future of the planet 
becomes um, inconsequential. And so that, that's, how, that's how the belief of free, in free will is very strongly destructive to our creating the most harmonious, beneficial reality through education for ourselves and, and, and future generations. Do you see any uh, drawbacks of the current education? Well, I mean, certainly um, at this point in our planet, it, um, there's so much competition where, where what needs to be um, is cooperation. That, that's uh, an essential drawback. To my reasoning, my, my main field of study is, is human happiness, mm -hmm. which is very related to goodness. So um, to the extent that our schools are teaching our kids a lot of information and, you know, let me phrase it in the positive. If we were to start teaching our kids um, how to become happier, better people, that, that would be the most um, beneficial use of, of education. I mean, naturally, they have to learn how to read, write, how to, you know, uh, eventually uh, work at some kind of, of job, a trade, or whatever. But since life is about happiness, and since goodness, as, um, as philosopher John Locke defined, is that which creates happiness, then, um, then the teaching of goodness and happiness is, is you know, and, and again, I, I can't, you know, one last point about how it should change is that um, in order to facilitate these changes of, of going from competition to cooperation, um, the school systems should, um, should begin to teach that human will is causal and not free. You know, just like now we teach that the Earth is not flat. It, it, you know, it's, the Earth is an orb, it's not flat. Um, we, we, we should be teaching our kids um, not the um, belief-driven or the antiquated understanding of human will, but you know, our best guess now that encompasses all of, of past traditions uh, as well as our um, current uh, scientific um, experience. Mm -hmm. There have been some studies uh, done where they induced certain people to believe that they don't have free will and there was another group in which they induced that you know they do have free will and then they were made to do make certain choices and what they found out was that the group that did not believe in free will uh, made more uh, unethical choices. How do you, what do you say about that? It's a simple uh, explanation. Th this research, I'm familiar with it, it's a, at a very primary stage. Mm -hmm. In other words, like, they lead their subjects to believe that, well, if, you know, if you're saying um, you don't have a free will, then that means you can do whatever you want. And, 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 and that naturally, that's a very primitive and unuseful understanding of causal will. You know, because like, for example, I believe that, that um, my will is causal and not free. Okay, but I do not, um, I do not take that as license to, um, to, to do more. So basically, in the experiment you're referring to, part of the teaching, part of the instruction that has to be given, or part of the understanding that has to be um, achieved between the subjects who believe in causal will and the experimenter is that the subjects who believe in causal will also understand that their, regardless of the causality of, of their actions, their actions do have consequences. Uh -huh. um, so, so my guess is that in the experiment you're referring to, you know, their subjects had the, the understanding that everything is causal, but didn't have a complete enough understanding of the idea that, well, yes, it is causal, but, but our, um, our actions do have consequences um, that are causal, and, um, and that it, it's just, it seems wise, um, and this is kind of like a moralistic um, statement, but it, it seems wise to, um, to do what's right because part of our causal understanding of nature is to understand that God or the universal reality tends to reward goodness. And so, so, so again, but the, ba the basic answer, Nomi, is that um, my guess is this kind of research is research with an agenda mm -hmm. because um, there, there, is a, um, there are psychologists who are very tied in with the Judeo-Christian, you know, Islamic, I suppose, tradition of, of, um, that, that requires free will for more uh, responsibility. So yeah, there are some psychologists that um, 
they really are, um, you know, attempting to um, to create this doubt in 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 in, in kind of like a subject that there is no doubt about, you know, um, within the physics, even within the experience. Mm -hmm. So somebody who doesn't believe in free will and is in a situation where they have to exercise self-control or they have to delay gratification, uh, there are going to be some deterministic consequences of whether or not one believes one is free to do some, one thing or the other. So one of the basic understandings in free will debate is that you know one could have done otherwise because one is free to do so. Uh, whereas what you're saying is that you know our causal will uh, is the way it is because of the causes that have been at work until that point of choice, and one cannot do anything about it at that point in time. Right, and 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 like, you know, they're trying to the, these psychologists are trying to present the idea that it's better to believe in free will than not to because they again they they say in this uh, in this uh, study that people who believe in free will act more morally but think about it let's let's extend that study to human civilization mm -hmm. you know to um to our um my god our um attributing some kind of like evil to a to a country or to a person in a country and then just invading that country or something like that this has this has uh, my my guess is there is far far more evil conducted within the premise or the this illusion of free will than within the uh, the causal perspective you know because when when you believe in free will you believe in personal ra responsibility you believe in blame you believe if somebody d did something wrong they deserve to be punished and 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 there's 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 been so much wrongful punishment of ourselves and each other because of this belief so again this this is a kind of experiment that um will probably not last very long within the field, within the literature, because it, it is very primitive and, and I think relatively easy to, um, even on a philosophical level, not even going to the empirical um, research to, to refute it. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add something, John? Well, I'm a little bit confused. <clears throat> um, when you're talking about free will, I translate in that, uh, I, uh, my belief is that we have, a con we have will, we have volition, and that it is necessarily constrained, and f freedom makes no sense without constraints. And I mentioned that earlier. Uh, language, we can use words, and we can use novel arrangements of words that I've never said and you've never heard. We can still understand one another because of the, there's a syntax, there's a laws of grammar that support that arrangement of words. So I'm free to make up all kinds of sentences that are novel and uh, maybe unusual, maybe boring, who knows. But that freedom is also deeply constrained um, because I can't make up a new grammar and be comprehensible to you at all. Just like I have the freedom to get from one side of town to another side of town, I live in Manhattan, because there are stop signs and there are red lights and the, the traffic obeys those signals. So as a pedestrian, you're more likely to be safe in the city because of those kinds of constraints. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think we need to uh, bring in the, that middle, uh, that excluded middle, and realize that there is no freedom without constraint. And that's our body. Well, our body is constrained, yet within those constraints, we have dance, we have all kinds of uh, ways of moving our bodies, and um, we have yoga and tai chi, um, but and that we're free to practice all of those martial arts. But you know, that's because we are uh, working with those constraints. So I think that's part of the the dialogue as well. But John, I mean, are you saying then that um, that um, that those kinds of like choices in, in in grammar and in sentence structure that you might make? are free from the causal past, that you're freely willing them. Well, no, it's like, uh, you know, the traffic signals, I didn't create those, but I obey them because they make sense to me. And there are a lot of laws that have been laid down collectively, like we drive on one side of the road, the, the Brits drive on the opposite side of the road. Uh, they, we could, uh, you know, legislate that a change if we wanted to. Um, but there's, it's in a lot of people's interest to follow those rules. But they are, you know, enforced. 
Um, that's all I'm saying. All right, because like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But that's what gives us our freedom to travel with greater safety because we obey those kinds of rules. Right, and at this point, I think it's be, it which be are a form of constraint. Yes, you know? and and I think though that the relevant um, consideration is here is that there are different ways of describing or defining freedom. In other words, like from the context you're using. Um, we are free as civil agents, as, 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 as um, citizens, as people, to do certain things and not um, within the legal parameters of either our, our city, state, um, country, whatever. Or the political or the cultural. They're exactly. All, they're all interrelated. Right. But, all right, so that's, that's kind of a freedom within a legal context. But then that we have to distinguish that kind of freedom from the freedom of will, you know, so so we may like decide to obey the law or not, you know, we have that freedom legally, you know, uh, and if we don't, we pay consequences. Or, but regardless of what of what our choice is, that choice would necessarily be completely compelled by the causal past that naturally um, is responsible for all change in the universe. Well, what about the future? Okay, well, because most of the choices I make are based not strictly on the past, but on some version of the future. So I believe our imaginations are real, because we make decisions based upon uh, our hypotheses, our gut reactions, our hunches, and we wouldn't have survived very long if we hadn't been able to do that. So it's not just about reconstructing what happened in the past. Right, and that's a very good point, John, because what happens is that um, our ability to um, to look into the future and make predictions, um, base our actions on those predictions, um, could not happen without information. You know, we're, we're we're using information. We're using our our inherited intelligence. We're using our personality. All these things are coming together to um, to result. Well, I, I tend to agree, uh, partially agree with what you're saying, and uh, I don't know if you mentioned um, when. Um, the personally acquired and the the cultural are at uh, oh, at an impasse, or there's right. a dilemma that uh, paradoxes pop up. So you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. It's like a bind, like Socrates. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious about that. Uh, how do we deal with those kinds of paradoxes? Because they do feel very much uh, on the subjective side as if it makes a big difference how I decide upon this, and I don't know what the consequences are going to be. So there may be some principle that I have mm -hmm. to live out of, and I may decide to do that, even though there may be a, a high price to pay culturally. Um, so that, I think, is uh, has a lot to do with this free will versus determined determinism. I, I think we all feel like we're agents subjectively, and it makes a difference how we decide. Yet I do agree that conditions are set up probably genetically, partially genetically, um, socially, um, you know, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, all of these uh, things are co-arising, and uh, we are, in, to some extent, expressions of all of that. So I, I have, I'm in partial agreement with you um, that it's not just all about uh, the ego or me uh, or having a good day or a bad day, but a lot of the 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 decisions that other people made uh, are affecting me, and the decisions that I make are going to affect other people. So I think this also has a very Buddhist uh, right. tone to it, I'm sorry, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up, because when you talk about Socrates and the kind of choice he made uh, in the kind of circumstances he was in, you mean to where there was, the a clash, there was a clash between uh, what the culture wanted him to do and what his own personal growth and development uh, led him to do. and. Cognitively, he was at that illumined mind, uh, that super mind level of consciousness, where for him making that choice of drinking hemlock was inevitable, given his moral development, given his uh, psychological development. So, I mean, we are not Socrates, we, but we can perhaps have that example in front of us that there might be situations where uh, what is uh, a higher moral order sometimes might conflict with the laws of the tribe. Right. I mean, Bertrand Russell was able to make certain choices which were beyond the tribe. 
uh, and there have been many, many examples, although very few in human history, who have transcended cultural conditioning uh, and have uh, made choices which were highly evolved. And I think uh, if we understand human growth and development and the conditions which create that kind of development, we can make those uh, ideas part of the curriculum for education of, of children. And I By think uh, looking at those persons who were able to do that, like Gandhi or King right. or, or those... Uh, I, I strongly believe so, George. Would you like to add? To oh, that? absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just the idea that um, when we understand that there are reasons for what we do, whatever we do, why we choose whatever we choose, why we, you know, plan for the future, however we plan, when we understand that there are reasons, then we understand that we can learn those reasons. And there's two ways to learn things generally in, in this world. One, we learn through our personal experience of either you know, getting it right or making a mistake and getting it wrong, or we can learn from the experience of others, where others have gotten it right or gotten it wrong, and we learn through their experience, and that's what education is about. Mm -hmm. you know, so that if, if we can, you know, the, the better we educate ourselves to make decisions that are both in our personal welfare and the welfare of everyone, then that, that benefits everyone the most. And, um, and ag again, that, that is a causal process. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, when you discuss uh, causal processes in the realm of education, uh, I would like to mention George Lakoff's book, uh, The Political Mind, mm -hmm. and who has worked a lot of, uh, he has a lot of writings on metaphor, which John is a specialist on. So I would love you to bring that up. And what I want to say is that Lakoff talks about uh, how propaganda and how the ideas that are repeated to us over and over again, how they form a cognitive unconscious. And that cognitive unconscious is very much active when we have to make certain choices of political nature. So I, I think, didn't he talk about the, the, the Democrats were uh, a benevolent parent and the, mm -hmm. the Republicans were a, a strict father? Strict authoritarian father. A strict father. Right, the, the metaphors that he used. And those are sort of metaphors that sort of organize the behavior of a lot of the people in those... Uh, in those particular right, parties. Right. And his idea of cognitive unconscious is, is quite explanatory when you look at the choices that people make who have a certain specific cognitive unconscious and compare cultures. And you can see some kind of a, a relationship there. Uh, so, I mean, the more we understand the way our brain works, the, I mean, brain is a causal system. And the better we would know why we made a certain choice the way we did. And by deconstructing those factors, we can have a better understanding of our choices. And I think that that's what one of the gifts of this uh, whole debate has been, that we can perhaps understand uh, what kind of human beings we are, where we are in our development, and what we can do to evolve our consciousness. Right, and I think that's where we're in a, a kind of big uh, impasse, because I may have the freedom to you know, choose certain kinds of things for myself. Um, but uh, if I want to uh, recycle, for instance, if it's just a personal ambition of mine, it's going to have no economic advantage at all. But if, I, if there are enough people who agree with me that recycling is a good idea, uh, we need about 10, maybe 15 percent of people who would agree and make that a practice, the whole culture would shift. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have a, a majority of people right. signing on. Right. So mm -hmm. we're living, I think, in a very unique time where our personal initiatives can have uh, very large-scale effects. Mm -hmm. um, and I would hope that would be in part of the, the, the curriculum that you were describing. <laughs> right. yeah. and, and maybe it's already, there, there are some uh, advanced medi uh, me meditator educators who are <laughs> out there even now as we speak trying to bring that about. Yeah, and during this, uh, these discussions we will explore uh, Ken Wilber's model, uh, integral education model, and you can also bring in uh, modeling, symbolic modeling, uh, Mark Turner's and Lakoff's model. So all those uh, models help us understand uh, the kind of choices we make and how we can improve them. And John, I think your point is, is, is important in that um, the entirety of humanity does not have to understand that human will is causal for humanity itself, for you know, all sentient beings to benefit therefrom. 
And then, then the question becomes, well, um, what would, um, you know, how would that, that um, change take place? And that, that we can only guess at. But I have a feeling it'll be grassroots. I have a feeling it'll go through, you know, the, the scientists among us, then, um, then perhaps filter through the clergy before it reaches the government. I mean, it's all um, pretty, um, you know, it's guesswork. It's, you know, we're, we're, but, but the idea is that, that, um, that we may experience profound benefits to our planet by, let's say, just 5 or 10% of the human race um, understanding that, that will is causal. So, um, so, the, um, so I think you're bringing up a, uh, an important thing about uh, the, that we have our individual brain with its you know, thresholds and proclivities and genetic history, but we also have a social brain because mm -hmm. um, it's the brains when they come together. And we don't have a, as I understand it, a, a neuron, its activity is never uh, individual. You always have cell assemblies and uh, they fire or don't fire depending on their relationship to other neurons. Right. Correct? right. So hey guys, we've got society, that would be minute. true as well. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, so would you like to close the program? Well, just the idea, that, I mean, we're going to get into a lot more of this in, in more detail in future episodes, but there are very many interdisciplinary ways of, of understanding mm -hmm. um, how the past creates who we are and how by creating who we are now, we, um, whether in science or education or politics or sociology or whatever, that we're always compelled mm -hmm. by that past. And I would add the future's important as well. Well, yes, but the vision of the future. recreations of right. our Naturally. ongoing embodiment, very essential. Right. Right. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Nomi. Thank um, you. Okay, in the future we'll explore other um, ways of understanding why our human will is causal rather than free. And I hope you enjoyed the show, and um, we'll return. Thanks. Thank you.